Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of UCLA Anderson, and we're delighted to have you here for today's very special discussion. There are others uh, joining us on Zoom, and uh, the session will be broadcast live. Thanks to everyone for your interest and for taking the time to be with us. Today's discussion about Sweden's foreign policy and domestic accomplishments in such areas as environmental issues and gender equality, as well as Sweden and Finland's recent application for membership in NATO, is both important and timely. We are honored to have a distinguished guest speaker, the Swedish Ambassador to the United States, here for the discussion, and it is my privilege to introduce her before inviting her to offer some opening remarks. The Ambassador will then join Professor Chris Tang, Faculty Director of the Center for Global Management and C Senior Associate Dean of Global Initiatives for a moderated discussion. Let me also note that in addition to our main speaker, we are fortunate to be joined today by Finnish Consul General in Los Angeles, who will be officially introduced a little later in the program and will join the conversation. Welcome and thank you both. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Her Excellency Karen Olofsdottir, Ambassador of Sweden to the United States. She took up her posting as Ambassador to the United States in September of 2017. But even before her current role, Ambassador Olofsdottir had lived, studied, and worked in various parts of the US, including as a high school exchange student in New Jersey during her previous diplomatic postings, and we're very proud to say, a visiting undergraduate student right here at UCLA, who also spent much of her time here at Anderson. So we're very, very happy to welcome her back. Ambassador Olofstadter is a longtime advocate for Swedish trade and diplomatic relations with the United States. Trade and economic growth remain top priorities for her today, along with defense, defense cooperation, public diplomacy, and strong collaboration with the inter international community. Her career in the Swedish Foreign Service began in 1994 with her first posting to the Embassy of Sweden in Moscow. In the following years, she worked in security policy and defense issues, as well as in numerous leadership posts within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including serving as Chief of Staff for several of its ministers and directors of, and director of the minister's office. She has also served as part of the Swedish delegation to NATO and at the Swedish European Union representation in Brussels, working with European security policy and defense issues. Before assuming her role as ambassador to the United States, she just served as director general for trade at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. She's also held the position of deputy director general and head of the Department for Promotion of Sweden, Trade and CSR at the Foreign Ministry. Ambassador Olofstadter, we're delighted to have you back at UCLA and I look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. It's always interesting to hear one's CV when one feels so young. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to be back. I told Dean uh, before that I truly loved my year here at the UCLA. And as you rightly pointed out, I spend most of my time at Anderson. And I hope that no one listens at the University of Lund, uh, where is, which is my alma mater in Sweden. But I learned more one year here than I did four years in Lund. And, um, uh, unfortunately, the sandwich place I always went to is gone. Uh, I don't know what happened to it. Maybe they tore it down when they tore down the, or when the old Anderson building is gone, but that was a great sandwich uh, place. I was asked to say a few words about my career, and you have uh, so graciously uh, uh, talked about my CV, but uh, for those of you who are considering Diplomacy, I can highly recommend it. I am what you would call the unexpected diplomat. I never ever thought I would go into diplomacy. Uh, my year here at Anderson, where I studied human resources and Russian and um, business administration, plus my degree in, in, in psychology and uh, business administration from Lund, um, made me think I would go into human resources in Russia because the Soviet Union had just fallen when I graduated. Or, you know, I was here in 92, 93, so the Soviet Union was had just fallen and a lot of companies were looking to invest in Russia. And I was thinking that they needed retraining their you know, people in Russia to, to fit to the uh, to market economy and so on. But Sweden had a huge economic crisis early 90s and there were absolutely no jobs uh, in Sweden. So the 
foreign ministry was advertising for the diplomatic training program. And I thought, I'll send in an application. I will never, ever get it. And I think that's why I got it. Because uh, when I went for the interviews, uh, they, uh, you know, they first asked me, so what do you think about foreign policy? And I was like, foreign policy is actually domestic policy. And after 10 interviews, I had a whole theory about it. Uh, so I belong to the 2% of others at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. But I've loved my career. Uh, I still love it. And I'm very proud to serve my country in your country, for those of you who are Americans. A few words about Swedish-US relations. It actually goes back to 1638. Uh, Sweden, for those of you who don't know, was a European superpower at the time. We were much larger than we are now, even though we are actually a big country uh, geographically. We're the size of California, but only 10 million people and uh, about 400,000 moose roaming the, the country. Two thirds of the country is actually forest. Anyway, we came here to establish a colony in Delaware and some parts of it still remain, but we were beaten after 15 years by the Dutch, so it didn't last that long, but still. Then, like in most countries in Europe, we got a huge wave of emigration to the United States in uh, the 1800s, and um, that's actually one of the reasons uh, you can tie that to our application to NATO today, because Sweden was extremely poor at the time. We declared neutrality in 1814. We had lost Norway. No, we had lost Finland, sorry, in 1809. We only had Norway left of our former great territory. Uh, and uh, the poverty, religious persecution, hierarchical society made a lot of people leave. So one fourth of our population left for, for the United States. Today, we are not poor anymore. Uh, we're one uh, of the richest countries in the world. Uh, and it's all about rankings, isn't it? You must know that as a dean at the university. <laughs> so um, we're number one in the Good Country Index of 2020. Uh, we were just uh, ranked as number one when it comes to innovation in the European Union among all the member countries. I think Finland is probably like number two or three or something. But you're the happiest country in the world, so that's okay. Uh, we are second in the world when it comes to innovation. Switzerland, uh, number one, and the United States, number three. And we are the second best country in the world to do business in. And I think this is really interesting for Americans to hear because um, the last uh, few years, uh, my country has been in the spotlight both for uh, COVID, but for other reasons as well. And on the far right side in this country, we are called a socialist hell. And on the far left side, we're called a socialist paradise, but we are not socialist and we usually joke that we're just a paradise. Uh, but anyway, uh, we are a market economy, capitalistic country, but with a welfare state. And I think the reason why we are the second best country in the world to do business in, because for the last 15, 20 years, we have done quite a lot of deregulation, a uh, lot of technological innovations. We still though live of many innovations that we did 150 years ago, like Ericsson uh, and other companies that are still doing well. Uh, and we also have a highly skilled workforce. Um, this doesn't mean that my country is without its challenges. Um, we just had an election. It was all about energy. Nobody talks about anything else basically than energy in Sweden today and the high, high prices of that coming from the war in, in, uh, in Ukraine, but also uh, immigration and integration and unfortunately organized crime and uh, shootings uh, are, have been high on the agenda as well. Uh, when it comes to our relationship, we are the 13th largest investor in the United States. Um, and when it comes to population in the world, we're number 90. So I think we're doing really well when it comes to our, our companies. And the United States is our second biggest market as well. And I will come back to our very deep defense cooperation. So our relationship rests on many legs, one could say, uh, or pillars, both our historic relationship and the immigration our technological development and our business, uh, business relationship and our defense and security relationship, but also culture. Uh, Swedes have always loved American culture. We have most McDonald's per capita outside the United States, and we are the first country to take on trends from the United States as well. Few words on climate. I was asked to talk about that. And um, 
that's of course something that has been very important uh, or is extremely important in my country and, and here as well. And we have a climate act, which I think is very good. It makes every government have to report to parliament every year on what reforms they have done and how it's going when it comes to climate change. And we have long standing goals. I think most governments try to be as ambitious as possible. Uh, that we, our goal is that we will be the first fossil free welfare state uh, uh, when it comes uh, uh, with net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. Very ambitious goal. I hope we can meet that. And we've had actually great conversations here in California or Los Angeles today uh, on, uh, on um, smart transportation and vehicle emissions and so on and the future of that. Uh, we have a very interesting program called Fossil Free Sweden. Uh, it's industry driven. And I personally think that a lot of these changes are best if they come from industry and from the consumer. Uh, I think it happens faster then. So 22 different business sectors in Sweden have uh, taken it upon themselves to do roadmaps of how they will reduce their carbon footprint. And it, the time frame varies for different sectors. So. This has led to that we now have uh, the first producer of fossil free steel in the world. We have two plants in the northern parts of Sweden. We're also, you know, the cement sector is extremely important, uh, transportation sector and so on. So this is something uh, which I find uh, creates a lot of interest here in the United States, especially when I meet legislators, they are, are very curious of how, how we do that. And companies that are part of that are companies that you know, it's Volvo, Ikea, Securitas, is, if you see us, security guard with the name Securitas on them. They're actually the largest security company, uh, I think, in the United States, employing 100,000 people. It's Swedish, so we take care of your security as well. Skanska, a big contractor out here in Los Angeles, and many other companies. And we have shown over the time that, you know, uh, getting emissions down doesn't hamper your economic growth. We have, since 1990, uh, cut our emissions by almost 30% and we have grown our economy by 86% at the same time. So there's no, those who say that you cannot do this uh, because you cut growth is not, uh, that's not true. Um, one other interesting fact, which I think uh, could inspire Americans is that we only put 1% of our waste into landfills. 54% uh, of the household waste goes into energy. So this is also how you can create um, uh, new resources uh, in our carbon-free economy. And um, we are also very lucky. Our energy mix is 40% uh, nuclear, 40% hydro. We have great rivers up north in Sweden and then is renewable for the rest of it. So we are not dependent on Russian gas or oil, which has also been important now in the, in the war uh, that we are seeing. A few words on gender equality. Uh, yes, I am the first female ambassador to the United States. That gets highlighted from time to time. Personally, I don't think about that very often. Uh, and I think it's just an advantage to be a woman. So that's to you women out there. There's no limits to what you can do. Uh, just go for it. We have the first feminist government in the world. Uh, the present government is right now a caretaker government. But when it was elected in 2014, our prime minister, a man, declared himself to have the first feminist government in the world. And uh, also when it comes to rankings, as that is important, um, when it comes to global gender gap, um, the World Economic Forum has ranked us as number five in the world. Unfortunately, the United States is number 27. And we top uh, the 2022 Economist Glass Ceiling Index, index which uh, measures the role of women in uh, the workforce, gender gap uh, pay, parental leave, uh, representation at senior management level, etc. And so we are number one, and um, the United States is number 20. So maybe we can inspire there to, to, for the United States to go forward as well. And we have also seen that when it comes to the Nordic economies, about between 10 and 20 percent of our growth can actually be, over the last 50 years, can be attributed to female uh, labor participation. And the main reforms that we have done, uh, we did a long time ago. In 1971, we scrapped joint taxation uh, between couples, so we have individual taxation. 
And of course, that make, made it more um, profitable for women to go out and work. And then we had to create the daycare system and also elderly care system, uh, which is, um, I think, almost all children in Sweden start daycare when they're 18 months old. And we have very generous parental leave. Today, it's 480 days uh, for, for the parents, 90 days of are dedicated to each parent. So if one parent don't take those 90 days, you lose them. So this is also an incentive for fathers uh, to stay home with their children. In the government offices, you uh, get 90% of your pay when you are on parental leave. So if you're a man and you don't take six months of parental leave, you are actually viewed with suspicion. Uh, who are you who don't want to be with your family when you don't lose money doing it? Um, and uh, the feminist... A feminist government means that we also, uh, for every kind of political area, uh, we have to always do a gender analysis. So when it comes to our foreign policy, we have had a feminist foreign policy. And that means that we have been focusing on women's rights, representation, and resources uh, in our development cooperation. We give 1% of our GDP in development aid and uh, and uh, also when we do things uh, wherever we are posted so that's very important to us just briefly before i end because it's more fun to have a discussion uh, nato yes we had 208 years of basically neutrality and militarily being militarily non-aligned as i said in in 1814 um, uh, we were really poor we had been in basically every war you could imagine before that i read a figure that between the year 1000 and 1814 we were basically in 60 wars and that's not then counting the viking raids because i don't think anyone kept track of those so uh, we uh, were extremely poor. We got a new king, uh, had an import a French general. Uh, we thought it was wise to import a French general because he had actually, his wife was Napoleon's ex-girlfriend. So we thought that was very smart, but then he turned on Napoleon. Uh, but realizing when he came to Sweden that it was such a poor country, uh, he wanted still to play a role on the European scene. So he decided to um, be a peace negotiator. And to make that believable, he declares Sweden neutral. So that lasted over the First World War, over the Second World War, uh, and then in the, during the Cold War, uh, Finland uh, had to have a kind of friendship pact <laughs> with the Soviet Union. And uh, when NATO was formed, then in, in 1949, we decided that that was not for us, both because of the reasons of that Finland would then, we, we, our analysis was that the risk was high that Finland would have been gobbled up by the Soviet Union uh, and uh, that we would it would be better if we stayed neutral in between the Warsaw Pact and, and NATO. And to be honest, uh, we played under the covers uh, with the Allies uh, during this whole time, uh, but that wasn't really known to the Swedish public until, uh, until the fall of the Soviet Union and when we look, were open with our, our archives. Anyway, as I said before, uh, we have a very close relationship to NATO. We are an enhanced partner to NATO. Uh, since 1994, we have built up that relationship when we scrapped neutrality. So uh, in, at NATO, they have this membership action plan uh, that when you become a member, you have to you know, go through a lot of steps. That usually takes a couple of years for most countries. But for Sweden and Finland, I think it was an afternoon uh, because we are so, uh, so well prepared. And the reason for us now joining after all these years is, of course, Russia's unprovoked attack uh, on a sovereign democratic uh, Ukraine and the brutality that we saw. Of course, you could argue, why didn't you do this already in 2014? But uh, it was looked upon differently, um, the way that was done with, with Crimea and so on. But, uh, but, of course, 2014 led us to increase our defense spending and and, and become even closer to NATO, but this was it. So uh, when Finland, I think, started first the debate on joining NATO, uh, that debate followed in Sweden, and it took basically three months to change the policy we have had for 208 years. So I will stop there because it's much more fun to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. Thank you for so much for sharing your insights and also the historical facts about Sweden. 
So at this point, I would like to welcome you to join Thank us. You. Take a seat so that we can proceed with our discussion. Yes. Thank you. Now, Ambassador, uh, we're so delighted to hear that you said that Swedish uh, people love America. But I can also tell you that Americans also like Sweden as well. Good. We love ABBA, H&M. I'm also a fan of Björn Borg in my time. Now, but we must confess, we love IKEA a little bit less when we assemble your <laughs> IKEA furniture. <laughs> you know what I mean. All right. So now, despite Sweden. Let you know a test of marriage if you can assemble a thing together. <laughs> no wonder I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay. So now, despite Sweden and the United States have a very similar GDP per capita. Mm. Now, when you said that Sweden was a poor country, we can't imagine it. We thought that it's always rich. Mm. So the journey is really amazing. So later on, I'll ask you questions about that. Now, given that both countries have similar GDP, uh, Sweden has a GDP per capita around 52,000. United States has 60,000. But Sweden has more results to show. Then later on, why? As in particular, in the areas you talk about, environmental issues, social issues, like the gender equity issues, and governance issues. Now, let me begin with uh, the environmental issues. Now, as you point out that you, uh, Sweden is leading in many indicators in terms of environmental issues. Now, but now the world is seeing the climate calamities this year around the world. In the US alone, we have never seen so many wildfires Drought, flood, hurricane, you name it, heat waves, right? So we will worry about that. But then Sweden give us hope because it shows that it's possible, right? Now, so it's ranked number one in, uh, in, in many indexes in terms of uh, environmental measures. So what is your secret success recipe? Because the United States is trying to improve, but we're not there yet. You are trying to have an ambitious goal to make it carbon neutral by 2045. Yes. Yeah. So we are not even making a needle change. Mm. So how do you do it? Well, I think it's a long story because as I said, no, I, there was a gender equality, but we, we started already in the 70s. There was a huge oil, you know, the oil crisis of the early 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really, you know, uh, I remember my father had a huge American car. Uh, he was a traveling salesman. He had to sell it because, you know, he couldn't uh, afford to keep it running with the gas prices. So then there were huge incentives to, uh, you know, do new isolation of our houses. You got subsidies if you install three glass windows, for instance, to save energy. Uh, and luckily, we were lucky in the sense also, as I said, that we, we could go off oil. I still remember as a child when the oil truck used to come to our house and fill it up. But then we went on the electric grid with nuclear and water. So in that sense, you know, we were lucky that we had that energy base. We have not been dependent on oil and gas, and, and which is a, a, a large emitter. And then uh, we have had some kind of great, uh, in, in, uh, you know, innovative companies that have made this possible. But one other reason, which I think is fundamental, is that we have a law called the right of public access. So. All the land of Sweden, is you're allowed to walk and pick berries all over the place. So nature is kind of all of ours. And I honestly think that in our, that's something that's deep in our, ingrained in our psychology, our responsibility, all of us, for our nature. Now, we also have challenges. We are not sure we will reach the goals, but we are trying. But I really think that this is something that is ingrained in our, in our system, that we have to all take care of this because it's all ours. You're actually allowed to camp wherever you want in a tent, as long as you don't see the house where someone you know, lives who owns the land. So I think there are many of those kind of reasons. Thank you. It's very true. Because Sweden, uh, when I visited, I was so impressed. They have urban gardens. In any areas, people have the community gardens. They can grow the vegetables and, mm. so that they can reduce carbon footprint. Because you don't need to get that much mm. uh, uh, transportation from the farm to the supermarket. That's fantastic. And also, of course, our societies are built differently. In, in, in Sweden, it's older cities where you walk and bicycle and uh, use less of a car. So that's also, this, this society is more built for using your car. It's more difficult 
Absolutely. So, I mean, there are so many different yeah. factors. To Very this impressive. Story. Now, I can also tell you that Americans fell in love with a young girl. Her name is Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. And her passionate speech at the United Nations stole everyone's heart. Now, but she has been criticizing the Swedish government are not doing enough mm -hmm. for the climate. Do you think Swedish government is doing enough or not? I don't think anyone is doing enough. Uh, of course, it's difficult to be as radical as we probably should be because that would change people's lifestyles maybe too much and maybe that you wouldn't get them with you. But uh, I think we need to step up given what we've seen the last years, how, how, how fast this is going. But then we all need to change our lifestyles. So I think that's a tough decision for politicians to do. Good. I think Greta would join force with you to do more. <laughs> now, I And I am a singer. I have a gas car. Good. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I was so delighted to hear that you're from Lund. You went to University of Lund, mm -hmm. yeah? And also that is, uh, I found that the internal innovation is so impressive. In Sweden, they have a proven concept. It's by a company proven in Lund. The company is called Elon Road, not Elon Musk. It's Elon Road, and they come up with a new concept called, it's called charge on the fly. That means that they build the electric road such that you can charge your EV when you're driving. Now, do you think that this is scalable? Is it going to be the future for Sweden and beyond? It's from Lund. No, because I just, <laughs> we just learned today. We met, uh, there's a uh, project in Sweden called Drive Sweden, and, and uh, that person, our colleague, said that um, uh, the development of batteries is going so fast that most likely we will not have electrical roads because the batteries will actually help us uh, to not have to have that, and the charging stations will be quicker. Okay, but now in the United States we have charging stations, mm -hmm. but with other problems. They're, not poorly, they're poorly maintained and they usually do not work. So that's why I, I thought that maybe the electric road could be a cool concept. Yeah, let's see, let's yeah. see. So but let's, maybe the more electrical vehicles we have and the more people who have it, the better the charging station absolutely. hopefully will so be. So let's hope we get there because mm -hmm. the United States need that. Because mm -hmm. in California, we passed a law uh, just a few months ago that by 2030, then it's actually all the cars will be uh, electric vehicles. Yeah, all right, moving on. You talk about Swedish started with the feminist government, fantastic. And also I look at this rank number one in the gender inequality index. Now this index is established by the United Nations. It measures three things. The first one is females' productive health. Second, female empowerment. Third, female labor market participation. Swedish governments make it She's very successful on all three dimensions. How do you get there? Well, as I said, uh, in the early 70s, we had that reform, uh, the tax reform. And that was to get women out on the labor market to grow the economy as well. So because we scrapped joint taxation, that really made it much more profitable to, for women to go out and work. Uh, so I think we have a labor participation for about 80% of women uh, in our society. And that led that we had to have good Childcare, and as I said, elderly care. So we have built that out over time. And uh, it is, of course, uh, most important to get uh, you know, to equality, but it's also a, a question of national economy. Because, of course, you grow the tax base, you grow the consumer base, uh, and you grow the country's economy the more people you have in the labor force. Mm -hmm. So this uh, you know, has always been very good for our economy. Then. Uh, still, women are making a little less money than men, so we haven't reached that uh, but it's yet. Close. It's getting close. Yeah, it's getting close, but it's still not there. Uh, and also, uh, women are still doing more of the unpaid household work uh, at home. And then uh, we still don't have a representation on our uh, on the company boards uh, that are on the stock exchange, that are where we should be. So there are things to do, but it's much better than in many countries including the United States. Yeah. Now, talk about that. My Swedish students, they always praise about the maternity leave program in Sweden. So I look it up, amazing, compared to the US. US has nothing. Right now, as of now, the United States does not have a mandated paid maternity leave. It's not required. 
but Sweden is different. So I look it up today. The Swedes will get 12 months maternity leave and six months paternity leave. Doesn't need to be same, uh, different uh, opposite sex, same sex, it's also fine. And uh, so that means 18 months in total, right? Now, United States has nothing. Then the claim is that United States cannot afford to do that. But uh, yet, Sweden managed to do that. How, I don't quite understand the logic. How it's does it work? It's called taxes. <laughs> <laughs> understand. Yes. No. So, you know. The tax in the US is not low. No, but so this is how it goes. You know, we pay more. Most, a lot of people pay 30 percent municipality, around 30 percent municipality tax. Over a certain income, you pay another 50 percent of that income in state tax or federal tax. Mm -hmm. Then on top of the, if I earn, if I pay you $100 as an employer, I employ you, then I would also pay another 28 percent on top of that. So you cost me 128. And you receive about 60. So that is uh, the tax uh, tax and that goes into the system. So that's how we then can afford to have generous parental leave. But that's the choice that we have made. And uh, you know, when we have elections, there's never any debate on the welfare system as such or that we should have more or less parental leave. I mean, this is something that everyone, all the political parties stand behind, that this is how it should, you know, how it works for us because it both uh, gets women into the labor force. Uh, children can be home with their parents for quite a long time, mm -hmm. uh, for 18 months or a year, depending on what you choose. And we also trust the daycare system that we have built out. So I think it's a combination of all these factors. You know, the tax system that we all stand behind, we are prepared to pay those taxes because we trust what we get. We have huge trust in the government and the public sector in Sweden. It's going down a little bit, but still it's very, very high. So this is based on Trust in government and public service, preparedness to pay those taxes because we feel that what we get is get is of good quality. And so as long as we have that, our system will continue. It is amazing because one of my Swedish students taught uh, innovation. And Swedish government actually encouraged people to sub companies. So he said that he suspended his job and the, the job will guarantee for him for one year, uh, 18 months. So he started his own company. He said, don't worry, if it's not successful, I can go back to my old job. Mm -hmm. It's guaranteed. Yeah, you get leave of absence for at least six months usually. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a really a fantastic uh, opportunity for people to explore. They say, well, I'm getting bored with this new job instead of quietly quitting. Maybe I start a, a new company, try it out. If it doesn't, it's not quite successful, I can go back, right? So I think this can be a win-win. So I really think that there's something that we should learn from the Swedish government is maybe we can implement this, all right? Now, next one, I talk about leadership. I fully agree with you. These days, female can do anything what men can do. And better. And better. <laughs> But no, easy, men are also really good. Easy said and done. Mm, yeah. Easy said and done. Mm. The question is that the reality, a lot of female felt a lot of obstacles. So can you share with us, as a female leader in the world, what kind of advice will you give them such that they can actually have a better chance to become like you in the future? Yeah, uh, well, the thing is with me personally, I haven't really experienced that. I think I have been very fortunate. Uh, I have always just seen it as an advantage to be female because uh, nowadays in the foreign service, at least in the Swedish one, we're about 50-50%. When, when you go abroad, uh, I was ambassador to Hungary, for instance, and we were very few female ambassadors there. But if you do your job and you do that well, it's good to be different because you're noticed. I think that goes for any circle. To be a little bit different is always good if you do your stuff well. So uh, I think that's just an advantage. And that goes for men who tries to go into female, classically female professions, or me, well, women who goes into typically male professions. But so I think it's about, you know, seeing, how, not seeing yourself as, a sec, you know, your sex, you see yourself as a person. And then also I've been extremely lucky with my husband. He wanted to come with me. Uh, on postings abroad. I know that it is harder for men to take that decision to, to come along. Uh, but uh, for him, that has worked well and us as a family. So choose partner wisely. 
<laughs> Excellent advice. How can you top that? Excellent. Now, in real time, I must switch gear to talk about a topic that we cannot not talk about is the NATO membership. Mm -hmm. So you talk about in terms of uh, Finland and Swedish uh, government's joint force to apply the joint uh, uh, applications. So before I ask you about uh, how it is going, so please allow me to uh, invite His Excellency uh, uh, the Council General uh, Samimis to come join us on the stage, please. So let me say a few words to introduce uh, uh, Council General Samibis. He served previously as ambassador and head of mission at the permanent delegations of Finland to OCECD and the UNESCO in Paris. Ambassador for Team Finland, Director of Trade Policy and Director of Civil Society. Prior to his current posting in Los Angeles, His Excellence Samibis was a visiting senior fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs in Helsinki. His research focused on foreign policy issues related to international trade, technology, transatlantic relations, and sustainable development. Council General Samimis, thank you for joining us. Now, let me begin with you. Uh, Finland has a long history with Russia. Uh, it was a special region of Russia for almost 100 years, since 1809. Now, given this and also a 800 miles of border they share with Russia, given this special tie, uh, was the decision to apply for NATO, because you started first, the Finnish government, so is, is it uh, the decision to apply for NATO membership could be a sensitive one and a complicated one? Can you comment on that? Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me here. And uh, I just wanted to start by saying that it was impressive what I heard Ambassador to talk about Sweden. And uh, since uh, you mentioned also Finland and you said that ranking is everything, I need to <laughs> add something in addition, in addition to the happiest country, also least corrupt and best governance and uh, more stable and uh, number one also in the Sustainable Development Index and only number one in, in quality of life and press freedom. I say this because uh, Finland and Sweden, we are, there's a saying that we are dear enemies. We love to compete. And I think that uh, for Sweden and Finland both for having some success uh, in certain sectors, policies, it, ac it actually has to do with peer pressure, peer learning, and looking at the others, uh, for example. And this has to do also with my answer to your question, mm -hmm. a special relationship with Russia and the historic background. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we were part of the Russian Empire and, and also uh, we enjoyed a vast autonomy mm -hmm. uh, during the hundred and plus years. And part of that uh, autonomy, actually, it was also a nation building process. And uh, uh, we had our own currency uh, Finland was the first country in Europe uh, to um, grant uh, the right to vote for women in 1906 during the autonomy. And before Sweden? Uh, before Absolutely. Sweden. We were 1921. Wow. Yeah, okay. before Sweden. And, but more important, uh, we were the first country in the world uh, to elect female members of parliament. So it's, and this happened during the period uh, of being part of Russian Empire, <laughs> which is quite interesting, I would say. So uh, when we uh, became independent in 1917, we had our democratic basis, systems, and we also had already a, a strong civil society. And what happened in Russia? Uh, there was a uh, deep, dive in the abyss, abyss of the revolution and into the Soviet system, where democracy never had the chance, where civil society never had the chance to be established. And it was mentioned um, earlier that because it, you cannot talk about the Finnish relationship with Russia uh, by not talking about uh, two wars uh, in the context of uh, Second World War, so-called Winter War, that actually uh, was the first time that Finland made number one news in the world press 
because it was a fight against uh, David against Goliath. Yes. It, it was, uh, there were, uh, you had uh, 30 or so uh, Finnish tanks against 3,000 uh, uh, Soviet tanks, just as an example. We kept our independency. We lost 10% of our territory. And uh, after the war, uh, Finland uh, was neutral. We were not party of uh, Warsaw Pact, neither to NATO. And uh, we actually then, uh, after the Cold War, together with Sweden and Austria, we, we entered uh, to the European Union. Mm -hmm. and then, but, that, but by that act, we actually entered from being uh, neutral to uh, military non aligned mm -hmm. And we also had, also during the Cold War, extremely strong and warm relationship with the United States. But it came more intensive, and like Sweden, we took part in the different programs of NATO. Actually, I think we can uh, say that the both countries, we were as close as uh, you can be uh, of NATO alliance, but, form but without being formally a member. So my answer comes to the, uh, and the, uh, my answer is no. It was an easy answer because as Ambassador already told, what happened starting in December when uh, Russia questioned uh, the sovereignty, the self-determination rights, when they started speaking about spheres of influence, it was uh, for us a very strong signal to be quick we had a thorough democratic uh, process with a broad public debate. And uh, as was mentioned by um, the ambassador, Finland took the initiative and uh, the vote actually in the parliament was in, 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 in uh, um, May, 180 uh, members uh, supporting and eight members against, which I think good. It was extremely good that there was also against because it shows that democracy worked. Democracy mm -hmm. worked. So uh, we're now, after that, we have been hand in hand going forward, and 28 countries have uh, ratified. Yes. Still uh, waiting for two countries. And perhaps uh, you want right. to say something about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll get, get to that. All right. So that is uh, the next. Then, I'm, uh, since uh, thank you for. Uh, probably me to answer at the ambassador, but following questions. Now you join Finland to apply for the NATO applications. Everything's moving along. And 28 out of 30, uh, they are supportive. But the two countries are the roadblocks. These are Hungary and Turkey. Now, despite some closed door diplomacy, uh, negotiation in August, and then some kind of uh, agreement with Turkey, but now there are some setbacks just two days ago. So I wonder if you two can elaborate a bit more. Uh, would, that be, uh, would that be resolved quickly? Well, you know, we have a memorandum of understanding with Turkey. So it's Sweden, Finland and Turkey. And uh, it pertains to um, uh, terrorism. Uh, Sweden has a new law on terrorism uh, from the summer. Also, uh, it uh, entails um, uh, arms export, military equipment export. We just exported the first equipment to Turkey, uh, or took a decision on that last week. So we have shown them that we are serious uh, mm -hmm. in this. Uh, there's also been, uh, you know, talking about looking at people who who have, you know, background that would make them eligible to, to extradite from Sweden. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so that's a di discussion we also have with, with Turkey, where we are going forward, and we are getting more information from Turkey regarding people that they see are of their concern, and so on. So we really feel that we have met many of, of the demands of Turkey, and we take their security very seriously. We are Absolutely. going into an alliance together. Mm. Uh, so we, of course, hope that uh, Turkish government uh, mm -hmm. sees what we are doing. Uh, and uh, if the, what you referred to is this kind of TV program. Yes, yes. your there counterpart was a... in Ankara is being summoned. Yes, today. absolutely. Absolutely. And we have free press. We have free media. Mm -hmm. So freedom of expression. Okay. All right, so and, and we are used to in Sweden that you know politicians are made fun of. Understood, yes. yes. So let's hope that this will not really hinder. No, and I just want to add 
we are in a situation of war. There is a war in Europe. Understood. Yes. So us changing our mind is, you know, to join NATO, it is because there is a security situation that is extremely serious. Absolutely. And we want to join as soon as possible. Understood. Now, let me come back to uh, Council General's question. Uh, now, Ukraine. Ukraine just filed the application last week. Now, do you think this uh, application, would that be a, uh, would propel, make it go faster or hinder uh, the, the, the applications or is complete independence? What's your view? Uh, in my understanding, the, uh, the NATO countries, well, they have, of course, uh, shown their strong will and we're waiting, as was mentioned, for the two, uh, two countries to ratify. And I think the, uh, the speed that has happened, the 28 countries ratifying so quickly, it shows that, uh, I can, maybe I can speak for both countries, but at least for Finland, we're considered to be a, a net pro provider of security, not a net consumer. Not taking, I'm, I don't want to comment on, on the Ukrainian uh, application uh, for, for obvious reasons, but I, I do think that uh, uh, at the end, it's also about the existing NATO members, those who have already uh, supported yes. the two countries' membership, that uh, uh, we will hear their voices heard. And of course, size does matter. And I'm, I'm uh, quite optimistic about, uh, for Finland, that uh, the, uh, the approval will come. By the way, Hungary is actually re related to Finland. F Hungary and Finland, we have uh, strong historic roots. We both actually, the nations came from, from through Turkey uh, via Hungary, and some of uh, continued through Estonia to Finland. We're looking forward for, for their positive ratification and uh, hopefully quite soon. And I'm, I'm optimistic that Turkey will follow. Very good. And let's hope that the 28 countries that support it will not the remaining two to get it done quickly uh, for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. In your time, I'm, I want to leave a time for our students to ask uh, you questions. So now I'm open up uh, the, the question to the floor. Please come up uh, to the, the mic and also state your name and which program you're in and then find them questions right away, please. Uh, I have a question for uh, for you, the ambassador. Um, I know that there's like this really good cooperation between uh, labor unions and uh, corporations inside your country. I just was wondering, how do you manage like the balance? I do a balance basically, um, you know, free market versus you know, workers' rights. Yes. So we have a high degree of. Thank you for that question. Excellent question. We have a high degree of unionization in Sweden. I don't have the exact percentage right now in my head, but traditionally, no, we don't have a minimum wage in Sweden. We don't have a, a, a minimum wage set by law. The wages are always, um, uh, how do you say, formed through negotiations between the labor unions and the employers association. And this is what builds stability in our country. That's why we have very few strikes, because they are in agreement. And also, uh, the labor unions in Sweden, you know, 45% of our GDP comes from trade with others. We are, you know, just like Israel, a country very much dependent on our uh, business with others. And, you know, we, as I said, we're the 13th largest investor in the United States. We have huge multinational corporations, Ericsson, ABB, H&M, Skanska, a few of them has been mentioned. So the workers in Sweden are, you know, for, uh, they are free traders because they realize that them going to work every day is based on that we have an op open, uh, we are an open economy and that the world is an open, so they don't feel threatened uh, in a sense by the globalization of, 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 you know, our economies. So I think this is the answer. And also that it's always, there is no minimum wage. It is a constant, it is a negotiation in yearly cycles. Is there like any other things like um, regulations that basically the government do and like that helps facilitate this situation? So you mentioned No, like the government stays out of those negotiations. Mm -hmm. They are really uh, the parties uh, who, who do that. And that's very important. Then, of course, we have like the rules we said about, you know, paternity and maternity leave, sick leave, 
uh, the amount of money you get if you are sick and so on, that's all regulated by the government, but in dialogue with these parties. So that's how it operates. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> going back to NATO, we know that, of course, Ukraine, Ukrainian uh, candidacy to NATO is much more, um, let's say, polemic than yours and probably would, uh, if accepted, have bigger consequences. But by both of your countries applying to NATO and, and if you, whenever you get accepted, what do you think are going to be the consequences on a geopolitical level? Because, um, of course, um, it's, a, it's a strong signal towards Russia and towards the world. There's also like, why exactly are you doing this now? Um, and why, what do you think will be the consequences, both, both positives and negatives? Can I start? Please. Right. Well, if you look at the map, now we don't have a map, but if you think about Norway and the Baltic Sea and the three Baltic countries, uh, Russia, Poland and Germany, we were the two p missing pieces of the puzzle for NATO, for strategic defense planning. So with us joining, first of all, you get huge territories, you also get a border to Russia. But if you look at Sweden, uh, the size of California, if you add that to the planning of the defense of Northern Europe, you get a totally different strategic depth in, in your planning. And also, if you look from above the globe, you have Finland, Sweden, Norway, uh, you have uh, Iceland, the UK, you have uh, the United States and Canada. And we are, have all been talking about, you know, the role of China, for instance, in the high north, uh, Russia's intentions, etc. So you get also a planning possibility for that area, which is, you know, of geopolitical importance. So uh, I really truly believe that NATO is becoming much stronger with us joining because you get that whole, first of all, we have excellent uh, military capabilities, we have modern forces, we have operated with the United States for many years and other European partners, so we like top-notch military capabilities. Uh, plus then you get the whole, you know, the planning possibilities. So I think this is the biggest geopolitical uh, meaning of this. And of course it also sends a strong signal to Russia. We, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we were hoping for a, a free democratic Russia developing, you know, in, in a great way. And I, as I said, I've lived there, I've served there, I love Russia. I, I was really hoping uh, for, for the country to develop differently, but it didn't. And it, we have seen what uh, their politicians have decided to do. And that really changed it for us. So is your strategy to think that um, joining NATO would be, will have a dissuasive effect towards Russia or other possible yeah, I aggressors. certainly hope so, because we are part of, you know, the collective defense where we both give security to our allied friends and partners then. Uh, I mean, the Baltic republics are members of NATO, and of course we will have uh, obligation towards them, which also strengthens their security, I would think. But also, so we both will be security providers, but we of course know that with Article 5 we can also get help in a time of crisis. and. I think the war in Ukraine has really shown that you have to be a member of NATO. There is no like, I think in my country, some people have maybe thought that, ah, well, they will, we will get help if something happens. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah perhaps. And we, we have can, helped, of course, the yeah, Ukraine. Perhaps us, we but, can also uh, ask the Council General to comment on that, because there is also a fear, because Russia has also felt that it's being surrounded by NATO mm -hmm. countries and then Finland's so right next door. So like, I think that would be good yeah. for you to comment on. Uh, is it a concern? Because your, uh, your neighbor is not happy. Yes, well, actually, I agree uh, with the Swedish ambassador that uh, the membership of, the, of both countries will increase the stability in the Baltic Sea region, but also increase the security in Europe. And for, for the reason that uh, it does not, it shouldn't, and it didn't come as a surpri surprise to Russia, I don't think so. In uh, consequent uh, government programs already 20 years ago or so, Finland has had a standard clause that we have a NATO membership option if the security environment changes fundamentally and, and seriously. Well, this happened. And, and so it kind of, it, it wasn't any surprise to Russia and it could happen that Finland will apply because it was the option that we have defined for ourselves. 
And another reason which I think that also the Russians uh, will consider, uh, it doesn't come as a surprise to them that Finland never relaxed after the Cold War. We uh, have always had our general conscription in place, unlike in Sweden. Uh, and we have also a extremely capable and strong Air Force, currently 64 F-18 uh, fighters, which will be replaced by F-13 fighters, 64. And this uh, purchase was the biggest in the Finnish economy, and it was made in December last year. So there's a strong, there are very, on many levels, strong signals uh, to Russia that Finland only continues its very consequent role by uh, investing in defense, not only military, but also civil defense, a uh, comprehensive de defense as we talk. It's also about emergency supply, which is a unique in the world. Uh, you know, when we learned some lessons uh, after the Second World War, and uh, we are actually have been building on that consequently, and of course, this has been registered in Russia as well. I just want Thank to you. add, uh, we have also decided to, uh, Finland is already a 2% of GDP or even more, I think 2.2. We have decided to, a, to go, to get to 2%. Uh, so we are really, you know, uh, strengthening our security as well with both the Air Force, we build our own fighter jets. Unfortunately, Finland didn't buy Swedish fighter Sorry jets. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're happy you're having new good fighter jets. I think we, no, yeah. I, will, I will not say anything. <laughs> no, and we are also building new submarines. Uh, and I mean, we are really investing in our own security. We just bought Patriot missile defense system and so on. So uh, we are really strengthening is our David versus Goliath. No, I think we are actually uh, we have passed that phase, and we will become a member of a strong alliance, and that's a big change. Absolutely. Good. Well, thank you. Well, in view of time, I think that we can continue for, for days to discuss uh, uh, over these issues. So on this note, I, I want to, uh, on, on behalf of uh, UCA Anderson Business School, we want to thank the Council General thank for so spending time with us and also our ambassador. Thank you. Thank you.